Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. Today, I would, I would label this one an unpopular opinion, if I was going to label this one. Uh, but we're going to talk about uh, <clears throat> our identity is defined by our Creator. Um, you know, opinions abound these days. Everybody has opinions. Um, and many people believe that there's no such thing as an absolute truth. You hear that a lot these days, but that in and of itself is a true statement. So that makes them wrong. Uh, because they believe that's the truth. But, but we live in this culture that says, well, there's things that may be true for you, but that may not be true for me. Well, by definition, that's not a truth. That's an opinion or something like that. I want to define the word truth. <clears throat> truth is defined as the body of real things, events, and facts. A, trans- a transcendent, fundamental, or spiritual reality. What I think is interesting about that definition is it uses the word transcendent. It it transcends culture. It transcends where you are. It it transcends all of those things. It's true for all people at all places and at all times. So when we talk about truth, that's what we're talking about. And here's the thing about truth. Truth is way more than feelings. Right? Our feelings uh, come and go. We, We see this in uh, marriage rates, how we have feelings for somebody and then we lose those feelings and, and people get divorced and we, we see that. It, maybe it was a feeling. Maybe it was love. The Bible tells me love never ends when we look at the biblical definition of love. And, and truth is sort of the same way. But, but you know, <clears throat> how we feel should not impact our identity. And that's what I want to talk about today. I grew up in a neighborhood. I grew up in Martell Estates. And we had teenagers all over the place. And we ran all over the neighborhood playing all kinds of games. In one day, I could have been Magic Johnson. I could have been Andre Dawson for the Cubs. I could have been Alvin C. York. I could have been John Wayne. Literally all in the same day. We would play all kinds of games. We would play all kinds of sports. And, And no matter how many bombs I hit in the backyard, I really wasn't Andre Dawson. Okay, I wasn't facing major league pitching. I was facing a guy who thought he was Greg Maddox. But either way, all these things, all these feelings that I had didn't make me who I am. At one point, I thought I was a cowboy. And uh, I got two stories about a cowboy. One I can't share. You can ask my mom about that one. But either way, uh, at one point, I thought I was a cowboy and I was in the basement. And I had a BB gun that I thought all the BBs were out of. And a bad guy came on TV, and I shot him. But there was still a BB in the gun. And I got him. I chipped the TV, and for years after that, we, you know, we had those big, huge box TVs. TVs came, it was a piece of furniture back in the day. Chip on the TV, every time you looked at it, I saw my sin glaring right there in front of me. You should have seen my mom's face when that gun went off and that thing hit that TV. But uh, despite me wanting to be John Wayne, I was not. I had very little trigger discipline uh, to speak of, and it was, not a, it was not a good day. John Wayne didn't get whipped like that when his dad got home, I can assure you. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. We, 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 th- we think that the way we feel sometimes is what defines us. And, and I want us to, to get past that. We, we look at our feelings, and I want us to understand, we're going to look at something here in Jeremiah that shows us how that our feelings can lead us astray. Uh, our, our heart can be deceitful. You know, we, uh, when I was growing up, your, your parents would tell you, hey, you can be anything you want to be. And the purpose of that statement from your parents was, we want you to work hard. We want you to dedicate yourself to something. And you can, you can be something. You can achieve something. And, and we've taken that idea, and people literally think they can be anything they want to be. And, and they, they've sort of messed that whole idea up. And, and the truth seems sort of elusive today, but let's, let's go back to the beginning and let's look at God who created us and let's look at what he says and let's start there. So Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. It says, Then God said, 
Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. Now, in that passage, you see the word image and likeness. You're going to see image two more times. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. So we have this idea of image. We see that word in there three times in that passage. That we're created in the image of God. Man. That word for man there can be translated. It's transliterated Adam. It's talking about mankind. Mankind is created in the image of God. What does that mean? Well, this idea for image is we are a representative figure of who God is. And, and uh, what's interesting in this passage is, uh, especially in verse uh, 26, it says, Let us make man in our image. It's sort of plural right there. Who's the us and the our? Our. 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 From Lenore City, Tennessee. That was a little Tennessee coming out. Our image. It is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Together, the, the Godhead is, is in a relationship with each other. So this idea of being in the image of God is we're people who desire to be in a relationship we're people who are in the image of God. We have the ability to reason. We have a moral conscience. We have um, a spiritual dimension to us. And then it says we are created in His likeness. We have this, this desire for relationship. Uh, we see all these things. The, the other thing that it tells us is that we are meant to rule and to manage. This sort of sets us apart from all of uh, the rest of God's creation. We're the only creatures... That's a horrible word to use, but we're the only created beings that actually sort of plan ahead for food and manage and plant things for crops to grow and cultivate and manage and rule. God put this inside of us, this desire for survival and those things, and, and we're sort of set apart in that way. And, and, and God has given us a leadership role. And, and as we look at manhood over the next several weeks, we're going to look at this idea of leadership but as a whole, even as, as creation, that, that men and women have this role of leadership uh, on earth. That's sort of the role he gave us. So I want us to understand that when we look at this, that our identity, it says that he created us in the image of God, male and female. Our identity comes from God, the creator, not what we think about ourselves. Now, that's, I told you this was an unpopular opinion. But I'm just telling you what the Bible tells us. And I believe it to be true. That God has created us in the image of God, male and female. And you know the other part of that is science backs that up. There, I actually looked this definition up on uh, the government website, which was interesting by the way. Uh, science confirms this. This is the reason culture is trying to tell us that now sex and gender are two different things. Are trying to separate those things. But understand this. It is an attack on our identity as to who God created us to be. It's a, it's a great tactic for the culture and the enemy to, to attack us in our identity. So, but, but I want us to go to Jeremiah chapter 17. I want us to see something. Because we've got this idea of, of, well, that's not how I feel. Or my heart tells me something else. I want to show you something that the Bible tells us about our heart. Je, uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7. <coughs> If you've been coming here, I've used this verse a lot. It says, uh, the person who trusts in the Lord, let me start there. He's talking about people who believe in God and who trust in God. And then the rest of this passage is going to sound a lot like Psalm 1. Uh, it, it says, whose confidence, this person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is the Lord, is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by water. It sends its roots out towards the stream. It doesn't, doesn't fear when heat comes, and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. So the idea here is a person who trusts in the Lord will flourish. They will be blessed. Does that mean life will be easy? No. 
There, there may be a drought that comes. It says in a, in a year of drought, think, hard times may come, but we get our uh, life from God. We get sustenance from God. We get uh, our vigor from Him. And that's the idea is that we put our trust in Him. Verse 9, it says the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? See, the Bible tells us that above all else, our heart can deceive us. And, and we know this, right? We know that our heart can deceive us. We can look at our bank account, and then we can go to Amazon, and we can say, you know what? I really don't have the money to buy that. But you know that you can talk yourself into that, can you not? It's pretty easy. It's very easy. I, I say this about Amazon. It's, it's addicting in that you actually buy something twice. You get the joy of pressing buy, and then you get the joy of it showing up one day. It's double the satisfaction. That's why they're making so much money, right? You're paying for that feeling. But, but your, your heart can deceive you. I, I say this all the time. Think about who you used to date. Maybe you dated somebody in your past, and you're like, what was I thinking? Your, your heart can lead you astray. And, and we know this. This, this verse is not telling us something that we don't understand. But, but what does culture tell us today? Hey, just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. If we follow our heart, we're all going to be broke. Amazon's going to be rich, which I guess that's sort of an indication of where we're going. And, and, and we're all going to be deceiving ourselves. It says that our heart actually deceives us. It tricks us. And we can be tricked by ourselves. We can talk ourselves into anything. And, and this is the idea when we look at Genesis 1 and we look at Jeremiah chapter 17. I want us to come to this conclusion that who we are is not a, a, a part of a definition of how we feel, but it's who God created us to be. And that's where we should stand. It, it, it's not about this idea of feeling. That's a cultural construct. Our identity is God-given because He created us. Now, gender is a theology issue at the end of the day. Because it's part of this idea that we are image bearers of God. It's who He created us to be. Uh, and it's something that, that if you look at the way culture is going today, you can see that the world is trying to attack our identity. It started a long time ago. You think about, we'll get into this maybe when we talk about men, but think about TV shows or whatever. How many TV shows have a strong male father figure? You can't think of any. You, you know, most of us probably thinking like Mayberry, but you know, Andy wasn't married. I, I said this before, everybody was happy in Mayberry because nobody was married but Otis. <laughs> I don't know what that says about anything, but either way. But, but here's the idea. Culture is trying to attack, first of all, manhood. If they can get the father out of the home, if they can destroy families, it, it will... It will uh, it will help the enemy. So not only are they trying to attack fathers, they're trying to attack our identity as who we are and who God created us to be. Just turn on the news. Just watch commercials. You can see that there, there is a cultural attack. There are people fighting with school boards all over the country based on what they're teaching our kids. Because they're attacking the identity, the God-given identity uh, of, our, of our families. And, and we need to understand that God holds the trademark for creation. He's the one that created us. He's the one that should decide who we are and, and what we're about and how we bear that image of God to the world. So, so we look at this attack that is on culture. We look at this attack that is on us and our identity and we say, okay, how do we combat that? We all sort of see that and we all sort of understand that, but how do we combat that? Well, let's go to Daniel chapter 1. Uh, we've been going through Daniel in our Wednesday night Bible study it's been good until we went down this rabbit trail of prophecy and it, it got, we got way off the trail there, but <clears throat> it was good to learn some things. But in, in Daniel chapter 1, we're going to see some things about the identity of Daniel and his, his buddies and how they are attacked. And we're going to see how he responds to that. So here's what's going on in Daniel. Daniel's a Jew and he's got his, these buddies and they've been conquered by the enemy, the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans, however you say that. And there's sort of two ways that that can go. If you're sort of high up in, the, in the, the land that was conquered, 
You could be killed because you were supporting the other king, or they could sort of take you and make you their slave. And that's sort of what happens here with Daniel and his buddies. They were sort of high up in the, in the Jewish ranks. They were guys who were sort of on the rise. So this king conquers them, and he wants to take them, and he's going to indoctrinate them. That's sort of the idea here. So let's look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. The king ordered uh, Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility. Young men, without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction, in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. You know, people like me. You know, either way. Um, but, but they're looking for young men. These young men are impressionable. If you don't think that's true, think about, guys, what you did at 18. And your buddy said, hey, let's go do this. And you're like, okay. <laughs> right? Young men are impressionable. We do things impulsively, which is not a good place to be. So that's sort of why he's choosing this. Look at verse um, uh, 4. Young men without physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction, in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. He was to teach them in the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend the king. Among them, from the Judahites, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So, they've got these young men, these influential young men who are strong and they're knowledgeable and they're trying to gain wisdom. And they ultimately want to put them through this three-year school to indoctrinate them. They want to get the Jewish culture out of them and put in their... Chaldean culture in them. And it sort of started with some food things. Hey, we're going to change what you eat. And if you know about Jews in the Old Testament, they were really strict on some things that they couldn't eat. It was a big deal to them. So, so they were going to feed them. They were going to train them. They were going to um, uh, sort of indoctrinate them. And then after three years, they would be just like everybody else. And they will have them changed. But I want you to understand something here. In this passage, we learn a little bit something about identity. If you know about the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, a name in the Bible is a big deal. What you name someone is a big deal. If you've had a child, you got Josh and Michaela back there. They probably got the book of a thousand names or whatever and probably got in arguments over what we're going to name them. Or maybe it just came naturally. You were going to pass down a family name. right? Naming is important. So seeing Cassie and Logan back there, she's naming their expected one after her brother, right? And that, it's a big deal to be named that. It, names are important. So let's look at Daniel and his friends' names because these names are given sort of cast a destiny upon them. That this is who they want them to be. So Daniel's name meant God is my judge. Hananiah's name meant God has favored. Mishael's name means who is like God, and Azariah's name means the Lord is my help. So these men have been given a God-given identity. These were men of God. These were men who, who, were, who, were, who were young, who were trying to grow up. They were trying to follow God's way. They were trying for, to, to be all that, that they were destined to be. But, but here they've been conquered by the enemy. And, and they're just trying to stay alive at this point. So they've got some decisions to make. The, the culture is wanting to indoctrinate them. So what are they going to do? Look at Daniel chapter 1 verse 7. Not only were they going to put them through this school. Not only were they going to change what they were going to eat. But they ultimately wanted to change their identity. Look at this. Daniel chapter 1 verse 7. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave the name Belshazzar to Daniel. Shadrach to Hananiah. Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Now you got to ask yourself a question. What's so big about changing the name? Why was that such a big deal? The, 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 the guy who's over him could have just said, just keep your name, it doesn't matter. And, and, it, and it may not have mattered, but you can see what ultimately they're trying to do is to impact their identity. They were trying to change who they were. This is what culture does to us. It tries to change who we are. 
And, and, and the thing of it is, is when we look at these names that they were given, they were sort of the opposite of the names their parents had given. So let's break this down. Daniel, who is God is my judge, his name was changed to Belshazzar, which is Baal's prince. Baal was another god that the Chaldeans worshipped. So they wanted to change his identity. Not only do we want you to not worship your god, we want you to worship one of ours. Um, Hananiah, his name was God has favored. Shadrach, was, uh, his name was changed to, which means command of Aku. Aku was another foreign god. Hey, we want you to worship this god. Mishael, who, his name is who is like God, was changed to Meshach, which is who is like Aku. Again, a foreign god. Azariah, the Lord is my help. His name was changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nebo, another god that they worship. So you can see this indoctrination had to do more than just giving them some food and teaching them some things in school. It was going at the heart of their identity. And that's how the enemy attacks us. Is at the heart of our identity. It's the first order of business for the enemy to come after us and our identity. And this is how it happens. We, we run into this uh, in our culture all the time. And, and, and God uses circumstances, or the enemy uses circumstances in our lives to impact our identity. Here's how that happens maybe you grew up in a parent just up and left. And, and then all of a sudden, you project that on you. The enemy says, well, they left because of you. They didn't love you. Listen, if somebody left you like that, it says more about them than it does you. But this is how the enemy attacks us. He comes after our identity through things that we've been through. Maybe uh, something horrible happened to you when you were growing up, and it, and it impacts uh, how you live your life, and it, it impacts your identity that you're not worthy. Listen, it's an attack of the enemy. It's not who God created you to be just because things happen to you, right? It's why it's the number one attack. So how does Daniel combat this? How do we combat this, more importantly? And we're going to see it from Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. So let me tell you what's going on here. Daniel, who grew up a Jew, there's certain foods that they can't eat. And obviously that was part of what was being presented to him uh, in this indoctrination camp. Now he could have taken the easy way out. He could have said, you know, what's the big deal? Well, it's just a, it's just a meal, right? I'm, I'm, in this, I'm in this place, sort of God sort of abandoned us. Where he's let us be conquered. Why wouldn't I just, why wouldn't I just give in? It's just... It's just one little thing, right? And that's how it starts. But what does the passage say? It says, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself. He understood what was going on, that this was more than just, hey, something that you eat. He had determined that he was going to stand for God regardless. Now, I, there, there's something sort of, Interesting in here, the, 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 the truth ultimately matters in life. Whether we believe that truth is relative or not, the truth actually matters. When, when we think about the, the attack that's coming on our, on our families and on our uh, world, it's really become death by a thousand cuts, has it not? It's every commercial. It's every TV show. It started out as one or two, and they desensitize us to where it's all kinds of things, right? Death by a thousand cuts. And, and, and honestly, if you look at this for Daniel, this idea of eating the wrong food would have just been one cut. It's not that big a deal. But see, at some point as Christians, we have to draw the line. We have to stand up and draw the line. And, and here's the thing about Daniel. He stood up and he drew the line right there. What would have happened if he had failed in his experiment? He talked the eunuch into uh, letting them eat just vegetables and said, hey, test us in this and see how we look after this period of time. And God had blessed him and it worked out. But what if it hadn't? What if it hadn't? I believe Daniel was willing to die over this. I believe he would have. We don't know for sure. But he was determined amongst himself to stand up. He, this, this word for determined means to set it upon his heart. 
He was committed to it. He had drew a line in the sand. Uh, one, of the, one of the translations in the Strong says it means to lay hands on violently. He had dug in right here. This was a, this was a, a demarcation line for him. He had decided. And, and, and listen, we as, in our culture have to make that decision as well. So um, in my family, alcoholism it runs back as far as you can see. And that's probably true in a lot of families because it's rampant, right? And, and when I was 17, I gave my life to Christ. And I decided at 17 years old, that was not going to be me. It was not going to be me. I was not going to go down that path. I had determined right there that that was not going to be me. So you know what? That, how that made life easier when I got in those situations in high school and college? Because I had made the decision previously. Because you know how guys are. Oh, okay. You want me to jump off that? Okay. Because that's the way we are and that's how the world tricks us. So here's my question. We think about Daniel in this moment. Do we think that Daniel grew up his whole life just eating whatever he wanted and then all of a sudden he gets in this foreign country and he's like, nope, I'm out. I don't believe that at all. I believe Daniel determined a long time ago that he was going to follow God no matter what. That he was going to follow the truth regardless of the situation that he was put in. And we want to understand the key of how we fight this battle of identity is we go back and we say, listen, no matter what the world says about me, no matter what my heart says about me, no matter what sometimes even your family says about you or your friends, I'm going to go with what God says about me regardless. And I'm going to follow Him. And I'm going to be who He wants me to be. And, and that's the idea. And that's how Daniel withstood this. He determined, past tense, that he was not going to defile himself. Now, does that make this battle that we're going to face easier? No, in some respects, I think it will make it harder. Because the enemy's going to try to find any angle they can, they can to cost you your identity. Death by a thousand cuts. They're still going to come for you. And we have to be strong. We have to understand that, that, that the enemy is around us and he's trying to get us. So I'm going to ask TC to come up here and Danielle. And I, as, as they're coming up here, I want us to leave us with some wisdom from God's Word. And first of all, it's this. Make up your mind now that you're going to follow God and His Word regardless of of what the enemy throws at you, regardless of how you feel, regardless of what people tell you, that you, as a Christian, are a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, you can be a child of God. You put your faith and trust in Him. You can be a child of God. I want you to think about this. Daniel determined not to defile himself. And, and, and sometimes us as Christians, even as Christians, we go through this battle where we fail at times, right? Right? I want you to think about this. Paul, and we were talking about this earlier, the, the group of us, uh, and I thought I would talk about it today. Paul in Romans chapter 7 says, you know the things that I want to do? Yeah, those are the things I, I, don't, I don't always do them. And, and you know the things I don't want to do? Yeah, sometimes I end up doing those. And, and he goes on and he says, you know what? I'm a wretched man. He says, what a wretched man that I am. Who can save me? And we're in this battle for our identity. And, and we mess up, right? We, we, we fall into the trap and we say, who can save me from this body of death? Whatever circumstance you've been through, whatever's happened to you or, or by someone else to you or whatever that cultural construct that is impacted your identity I want you to understand Paul's literally asking this question who can save me and you know what he says at the end of that verse but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ and he goes on to say in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 he says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus we can be forgiven for that that's why Jesus came was to fix our identity was to help us when we fail and to show us mercy 
and to grace and to come into our life and to help us change us. You read the rest of Romans chapter 8 and it talks about living a life in the Spirit, how God transforms us from the inside out because He put His Holy Spirit inside of us to, to guide us and to, and to help us. And there's, then there becomes this battle. I'm not telling you that it's going to be easy, but there's going to be this battle inside of you that's between the flesh and the Spirit. It's going to be a war. But the Spirit, if we put our trust in the Spirit, we'll win. Would you pray with me? God, we come to you today, God, as people who our identity is under attack. Death by a thousand cuts. No matter what we watch on TV, no matter what we listen to on the radio, no matter what we see on, culture, on social media, it's an attack on our identity and who you created us to be. And God, you have a destiny for us, a plan for us. To glorify you with our lives. And we do that, first of all, by understanding who you created us to be. Not who we think we are or who the world says we might be, but who you say we are. And God, I pray that we, we capture that and we begin to live that out. That we begin to trust in the Spirit and lean on Him to live through us and in us and transform us from the inside out. And God, it'll help us to win these battles of I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy enough or nobody loves me or self-righteousness or whatever it is that impacts our identity that like Paul said what a wretched man I am but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ we're thankful for him God fill, fill us with your spirit and help us to walk in your ways in Jesus name would you stand and sing thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.